I see that we've started the recording. And then that brings me to the pleasurable part of introducing you, Lucy. And uh, for all those who have joined and those who will watch this recording before, it is really a pleasure for me to introduce Lucy um, uh, D'Agostino McGowan. <laughs> I do my best to pronounce your name. That um, was great. Thank you. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, she's an assistant professor of statistics at Wake Forest University, North Carolina, and previously a, a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. And um, uh, she's also co-founder of Our Ladies Nashville. So she's uh, our statistician in the keynote uh, programming for JupyterCon. And, and our person as well. She's created uh, some online courses that are very uh, well received and attended. She's developed several R packages and she's an avid organizer and communicator and member of the R community. She writes about statistics and medicine in her blog and she also co-hosts the Casual Inference podcast with Ellie Murray from Boston University, uh, talking about statistics, data science, epidemiology and uh, things like that. And also she's been embracing the challenge of teaching during a pandemic. And I, I read a very nice blog post about what she's doing now with uh, uh, experimenting with technology and uh, doing, uh, making her own light board at home uh, to, to, to engage her students. So I see a rising star in the open education sphere and we are very, very glad to have her join us uh, at JupyterCon. So with that, Lucy, I hand it over to you and I will stop my video while you present. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and to be able to talk to you all. Uh, so that was a very kind introduction. Um, I Today I'm gonna be talking about equipping and empowering future data scientists with confidence, intuition, and communication skills. And so in, in particular, I'm sort of gonna be pulling a little bit from what I've learned uh, as sort of building these uh, massive open online classes that I've been building and particularly thinking about how I teach coding to students uh, as well as sort of statistical concepts. And then I'm also gonna be pulling from over the summer, uh, I spent a lot of time kind of training and then also uh, kind of mentoring a group of uh, faculty at Wake Forest on thinking about kind of best practices for teaching in general and then also for teaching uh, in particular in an online modality. And so I'm gonna be sort of pulling a little bit from all of that. And then of course, I also just, I've kind of picked up things along the way from there are big leaders in the R community that are just great educators, both for among programmers and also for our kind of statistical concepts. And so some of the ideas I'm gonna be talking about today are directly pulled from a lot of their work as well. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lucy Stats, and I'm really excited to talk about these topics and some of the other topics uh, that were mentioned in the introduction that I work on, such as um, biostatistics and causal inference and things like that as well. And so uh, please find me on Twitter. And if you have any follow-up questions, I would be happy to engage with those there if we don't get them addressed today. So uh, first, I just wanted to, in case you'd like to follow along with these slides live, you can find them on my website. If you go to lucymcgowan.com slash talk, uh, you'll see a listing of all of my recent talks. And the first one will be this uh, talk, and you can click on the link to find the slides. Uh, so hopefully you can follow along if, if that's of interest, or if there's something that I talk about that I go through too quickly, you can of course always go back and find those slides as well. I'm hoping that this uh, talk can be sort of a living resource because a lot of the pieces I try to um, kind of keep them engaging, but also pack content in so that you can go back later and uh, maybe internalize it even a little bit better. I think from an education framework, sort of showing something once sometimes is hard to, to take in. So being able to come back to it and sort of revisit it uh, different different parts of it as they become relevant to you is hopefully something that we can do. Okay, so where we're going. So this is sort of how I've outlined this talk. Uh, I'm first gonna be talking about inspiring confident coders. And so uh, the idea here is sort of building on best practices in pedagogy broadly. Sort of, so there's all this research on how to kind of teach students uh, that sometimes as educators, um, at least for me, 
going through a PhD in biostatistics, we didn't really learn about the best way to teach statistics. We learned about the best way to implement statistics or to derive statistics. And in fact, once we finished uh, doing our PhD, many of us end up in uh, roles where at least a portion of our time is spent teaching. And so kind of learning about some of those um, methodological contributions, I think, in the pedagogical field is really important. And uh, it's easier to build up confidence in students if we're sort of doing it intentionally. And so that's what my first part will be with a specific focus on coding and programming. And then the second, the middle part of the talk is going to be talking about developing quantitative intuition. And by that, I mean um, intuition around uncertainty, which is something that I think is really important for data scientists. And in fact, I think it's just important for citizen scientists in general to sort of have a good uh, grasp on what it means, uh, where uncertainty comes from when we're doing a data analysis. And I'm going to just give three examples of the kind of places that you can introduce uh, different activities to help students think through kind of where uncertainty may originate and uh, how they can sort of get their hands around it in a way that's maybe more tangible to help them kind of understand it more deeply. And then the final part is going to, I'm going to talk about empowering strong communicators. And so, um, you know, especially for data scientists, it's really crucial that if they're, if we're arming them with the ability to do these really powerful analyses, that we're also arming them with the ability to appropriately communicate them. And statistical communication in particular is something that I'm very invested in and very interested in. And um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about kind of what I see as best practices in that area and sort of how to move uh, some communications that maybe are, uh, you know, um, kind of vary along this spectrum of being true and interesting or not true and not interesting and kind of getting us into the uh, into the white, right quadrant in, in that regard. Okay, so let's start with inspiring confident coders. So there's this concept in education called Bloom's taxonomy, and that's what I'm going to be building most of this talk around. And basically what this is, is it's an idea sort of of how to build up uh, when you're trying to teach a concept. Uh, it's, it's a paradigm for how to kind of build that up. And so this is sort of an, an ability to a, a tool to be able to do this uh, effectively. And so it was an educational framework that was initially developed in the 50s, uh, and then it was revised in 2001 uh, in a taxonomy for teaching, learning, and assessment. And, um, and I think it's one that's often taught to K through 12 educators, but I think it's so useful, and I wish it was taught more to sort of a broad spectrum of educators or even people that are just hosts or trying to self-teach. I think this is a really helpful framework because uh, not only does it sort of give some intuition into how students learn, so it kind of gives you a little bit of insight into that, but it also has this aspect of building up in an appropriate way uh, such that you engender confidence, because if you kind of skip from beginning to end with students uh, without kind of building them up in a way that's intuitive, you can end up breaking down confidence, uh, and especially with something like coding where sometimes there's anxiety and things like this associated with it, uh, important to sort of build up in a way that, that that set students up for success, which is, of course, the whole goal. So I'm going to be talking about Bloom's taxonomy, in particular, uh, focused on for coding. And uh, one thing I found, so I had this idea, and I thought it was such an innovative idea to be thinking about tying together Bloom's taxonomy, this concept that's used very much in K-12 education, but not so much in, in other areas, and tying that into using it for programming, I felt like this was a very innovative idea, but it turns out lots of people have had this idea already. And so uh, when I, after I sort of thought about this and I decided to Google around to see, oh, has anyone else thought of this? And it turns out, yes, lots of people have thought of this. And so these are a couple uh, different resources of people who've sort of already thought about this, although they approach it from slightly a different uh, angle than what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but there are blog posts, conference proceedings, and there's even a full paper on the ideas of sort of trying to develop uh, and build up coders by using this kind of taxonomy type method. And then finally, I want to mention uh, this, Mina Chittenkai Rundell, she's an a educator, a, a statistics and, and our programming educator. She uh, is a giant in our field and does an excellent job on uh, sort of communicating and, and educating students uh, specifically on how to program in R with the focus on statistics. And she has this great talk that she's given a couple times called Let Them Eat Cake First that doesn't explicitly kind of talk about Bloom's taxonomy in in those in that language, that, that same language, but she 
has a lot of the same ideas that I'm going to talk about today. And a lot of what I've learned have been from sort of watching what she does. And so some of what she's talked about in this talk that I link to here that you can find if you go to my slides, you'll see overlap for sure, because I've been inspired by a lot of her work. Okay, so this is this pyramid of sort of concepts. And what I'm going to do is walk through basically each of the steps. And I'm going to show how those can be tied to specific learning objectives and then how those can be tied to specific kind of activities that can be done in class. And I, hopefully this will be helpful to sort of help think about how you could structure a coding class that uses kind of evidence based pedagogy uh, as well as sort of just general good coding practice. And so the big picture here is that instead of jumping from the remember, so like the, the bottom of this pyramid where essentially in this bottom phase uh, students are just memorizing or repeating after you as a, as a teacher in the coding space, they might be copying code directly. Um, going straight from that to the create phase, which the create would be you hand a student, you know, an empty notebook and ask them to code something up themselves. Uh, instead of doing that, you're sort of actively building up the steps to get them to that confident place of being able to open an, a blank notebook and code something up themselves. And so when I first learned uh, how to code, I, some of my coding experience was a little bit self-taught, but in R, my R experience was taught in the classroom. And my first experience with R was a little bit like this jump where I was sort of uh, given access to the manual and given some tasks to complete and then was sort of just told to complete them. And that particular class was a little bit frustrating. It was hard for me to kind of tie together the pieces and it wasn't until I was in graduate school and I had some really uh, good educators that sort of bridge the gap between these uh, that I gained a lot of confidence in my R programming skills. And so I think that uh, a big picture here is that instead of jumping from uh, this kind of just these are the these are the functions and this is how you do it straight to uh, go ahead and do it yourself. We're sort of building it up along the way. And one final thing I'll mention in all of this uh, before I get started is that this is not to say that these need to be baby steps or in a way that's going to be boring to the student. These can all be filled with exciting examples and um, and kind of compelling uh, pieces along the way. It just is to say that you're doing it. You're doing it in a compelling way. That's also appropriate for the uh, kind of level of the learner. Okay, so let's start with remember. So. Learning objectives when you're trying to, uh, when a student is at the remember phase, so when they are right at the beginning of learning a new concept, when you're mapping that to a learning objective, these will be learning objectives that start with things like repeat, duplicate, define, and state. And the reason I'm focusing on learning objectives here is partly because just from what I've witnessed and also from kind of what a lot of pedagogical literature tells us, uh, if we can sort of first map out when you're planning what you want someone to learn, if you can first map out those learning objectives, and then from there kind of you can work backwards to work on like assessments and sort of then build kind of content in that order. It's just, it's a good way to sort of go about it. And so starting with learning objectives, I think is just uh, a nice evidence-based way to do it, and also a nice way to sort of map uh, directly to what I mean by each of these different steps. So in the remember phase, we're doing things like repeating, which could be something like repeat my steps to create a Jupyter notebook. So I might open my screen and share it with my students, and I might show them how I would create a new Jupyter notebook step by step, and then I would ask them to do that same process themselves. So they're not doing any coding, they're just repeating after me. Duplicate. So duplicate might be something like duplicate a scatter plot using the code provided. And so I, this is a fully copy and paste. I've provided them with all the code and all they have to do is copy it into their notebook. But this is still kind of practicing. They're learning kind of where code goes in a notebook and they're also learning how to compile a notebook and things like that. So there's kind of pieces that are, they're just repeating what I've already done, but they're internalizing it along the way in, in an important kind of uh, it's an important step in the process, and it's really the foundation for learning the rest of the different concepts. Define, so something like define what the ggplot function does. And so in the remember phase, you can get a little bit into memorization, and I do tend to try to shy away from having too much memorization. I try to sort of show my students how to do things in such a way that it feels intuitive. But things like um, showing them what a function does and then asking them to, to define it um, can be an appropriate use of this or state something like state the steps needed to install a package. So I might show them how to install a package and then I might want them to repeat back to me what I just did so that they can sort of solidify it a little bit. 
So if I'm giving them, if they're at this phase, I'm not giving them an empty notebook to just fill in these steps. I'm giving them a completely full notebook. At the remember phase, they get a notebook that has my text explanations and my code and maybe some more text explanations and some more code, but it's gonna be completely my, my work and they're just going to be kind of compiling or maybe moving different pieces around. Um, uh, but they're not gonna be actually writing any code themselves from scratch at this phase. Okay, so then once we sort of, we feel confident in that, we can move on to understand. And so in the understand phase, the learning objectives start with words like describe, discuss, explain, identify. So describe what this code is doing, discuss what this warning message means, explain why it's important to consider missing values, or identify which part of this code is causing an error. So for that, I might show something like I may have an error like this where I have some code in a notebook and it's still mostly my own code, uh, but perhaps when they try to run it, there are certain lines that produce errors. And so they would need to kind of go ahead and try to describe what's happening here, what's happening with this error message. And they might try to identify kind of uh, th th this error itself. And so here, my, my, my text explanation and my code is gonna still take up most of the space, but then they have, we have some space for a, a student's explanation of what's happening. So the notebook still contains only my code. They're not at the phase of writing their own code yet. They're just uh, explaining kind of what my code is doing in this understand phase. And I'm gonna show you after I get to the apply, after we go through the next one, I'm gonna show you how actually you can integrate all, uh, you know, a number of these different objectives into a single assignment kind of in different at, at different stages. And so it's possible to like have most of an assignment be kind of following the remember uh, learning objectives with a little bit of understanding and maybe a little bit of applying. And so we'll get to that in just a second. But I just want to mention that, you know, this is sort of a, fra a general framework, but it doesn't need to be like a single assignment mapped to a single one of these uh, pieces of the pyramid. So as uh, you know, and you can, as I mentioned, you can be linking these together. For example, I could pull in a remember objective here when I've shown this uh, error message, I could ask the student to Google this error message and repeat back what they find. And so the, the first objective would be something like describe what the what, what this error is uh, saying, but then the, the follow-up objective could be sort of hearkening back to that remember stage or that real baseline of what we're doing and ask them to sort of um, find what this error means and then repeat it back. So they're not kind of coming up with it on their own. They're just copying what they're seeing on Google, but this is still kind of an important piece of learning, I think. All right, so now apply. This is gonna be things like complete, manipulate, use, predict. And so complete would be something like complete the code to create a box plot or manipulate the data cleaning step to remove missing values or maybe use this starter code to fit a random forest or predict what this code that I've written is gonna output. And so this is uh, where it's, this is one of my favorite phases for students. Um, this is where I do what, what's called gappy code. And so for example, here's some ggplot2 code that's going to create a, a, a plot. Um, and in this case, I was hoping for the students to create a histogram. And so if you notice, I've got this, these little gaps here in my code just delineated by these lines. And so the students are given a, a lot of the code to as kind of scaffolding, and then they're given specific parts that they're asked to fill in. And I really like this because it targets kind of specific learning objectives. And so if you want them to be learning about kind of how to plot, create different types of plots, you might focus on kind of this geome uh, argument where you're swapping out uh, the part that's that's dashed here is going to swap out depending on what you're creating, like a histogram or a box plot, et cetera. Or if you're focusing on titles and access uh, access titles and overall titles, you know maybe you'll focus on this labs part where that would be what they're filling in. So they're not faced with just this blank page yet. They still kind of have some scaffolding to start with, which I think sort of helps with that confidence aspect. And so in this case, my notebook that I give a student is gonna look something like this in terms of proportion. There's gonna be some of my text explanation and a little bit of my code. So that's gonna be still provided, but then the student is expected to explain a little bit. And so sort of building on what we know from the understand uh, part, they're sort of explaining what's happening in, in some of this notebook in their own words. And then uh, they have some of my gappy code that they're filling in. And so they're still not faced with a blank document, but they're sort of 
building up to, to being able to eventually do that. Okay, so time out. I'm going to go uh, back to what I mentioned where I was saying that instead of kind of thinking about these all separately, we also can think about them kind of collectively. And I think these first three, I spend a lot of time on this remember, apply, understand space with students. And uh, it's nice, it's a nice kind of grouping to be able to think about assignments that sort of map to these learning objectives. For example, this is the assignment I often give on, on day one. I gave an assignment like this to my statistical learning students. And so they were, it's a machine learning focused class with a focus on the statistical aspects of machine learning. And then I also gave this assignment to my linear models class uh, this year. And this is largely based on Mina, Amina's um, recommendations on sort of how she starts off her data science courses as well. So on day one, uh, my learning objectives are for the students to be able to repeat the steps that I've shown them to open a notebook and run the code in that notebook to create a plot. And then they explain what the plot uh, code is doing to their neighbor. And then I have a stretch goal to ask them to use my code as scaffolding to create a new plot examining different variables. And so this first part, repeat the steps and run my code, this is, completely in the remember part of the, and, and that's the majority of this assignment really. Most of the, what they see, in fact, all of what they see is fully completed code that I've written along with explanations. And so that's the majority of, the, of what they're doing kind of on day one to sort of get them started. But it's an exciting example and it makes a fun looking plot. And, uh, and I think um, it sort of lends itself to this next stage of explain, explain what the plotting code is doing to your neighbor which gets at that understand. And so this is just, the plotting code is just one part of the, of the, uh, of the full text. And I've written out um, this notebook in such a way that there, all of the context clues are available to figure out kind of what's happening in this plot without understanding kind of coding itself. And so it sort of allows the students to be able to map kind of what they understand just about like reading the English language to uh, what the code itself is doing. And then finally, I include a small stretch goal. And so I have this learning objective that they can use my code as a scaffold to create a new plot examining different variables. And so essentially what I'm asking them to do here is I say, edit the code for my plot and swap out one of the variables with a different variable. And so it's a pretty easy task. They have a list of the variables as part of this assignment. And so in the actual document, they can see a list of all the variables and they can see the variable name in the plot and they basically just need to swap it out. And so it, it, it sort of slowly builds up that confidence that coding's not so bad, it's actually really fun and you can just sort of swap things in and out and, uh, and you can generate a whole new plot all by yourself. And so this day one, the kind of proportion of each piece is like most of this, uh, this particular assignment or, or this activity is spent on the remember phase where they're just repeating what I've done. And then a, a small portion is spent on understanding. So sort of trying to explain back what, what the code is doing based on the explanations that I've included in the, in the document. And then finally, they have a stretch goal, which includes an apply objective. And so as my class goes on kind of over the days or the weeks, depending on the structure, if it's a workshop or, uh, or a full semester, these sort of stretch out and change. And so, you know, by the second class, maybe we have a little bit less on the remember uh, and maybe a little more on the understand. And by the third class, the majority of the time is spent on the understanding. So sort of describing what's happening, less is spent on just memorizing. And maybe there's a little bit more of the apply stretch goal. And then by day four, we're spending kind of very little time on the repeat or the remembering kind of part, uh, much more time on understanding and applying. And then finally, by something like day five or kind of wherever, the, kind of depending on the trajectory of your class, kind of once you're uh, several classes into teaching something, then most of the time is spent on the applying. So lots of gappy code for them to fill in uh, and, and less of them just copy and pasting exactly what my code is doing. Okay, so back to the, the pyramid, the next uh, step is analyze. And so the learning objectives for analyze are things like outline. So outline the steps needed to fix this error message. Differentiate, uh, differentiate between these two cells of code. Question, so question the assumptions that underlie this model or experiment with this code to examine the data in a different way. So for example, I might show code like this where I have two different models and in the way this code is written, uh, the only difference between these two cells is that one of them is fitting a logistic regression to the data and the other is fitting a linear regression to the data. 
And so in this analyze phase, the students, um, they wouldn't necessarily be at the stage where they could tell you which one, they couldn't necessarily evaluate which one was preferable, that's the next phase, but they could analyze kind of what's different between these two uh, sections of code. So I would ask them kind of, what's the difference between this code? And I'd want them to identify, you know, that these first two lines are different um, with the emphasis on the first is looking at logistic regression, the second is looking at linear. And then I might want them to also be able to talk about what assumptions does that mean uh, for each of those? So sort of analyzing what is assumed by the, by the coder by uh, choosing kind of one set of functions to use versus another. And so here, this is where the students, uh, their, their own code may start coming in and their own explanations pretty much fill the whole document. And so the document that they get, they see at first, it might have some space for them to explain what's going on. I might still provide a little bit of code, for example, like that code I just showed where I would have kind of as a couple different cells and ask them to kind of describe what's happening in, in each of those cells and sort of uh, discuss the difference between them and why, what the assumptions that underlie those differences are. But there also is an opportunity for them to start kind of coding on their own. So again, they're not starting from a blank slate, but they are sort of building up to this process of being able to, to analyze what's actually happening. And then in the evaluate stage, now we're gonna be doing things like assess whether this code is efficient or critique your partner's code. Uh, that's really helpful. I think a lot of peer review type things are really useful, peer programming and things like that. It's very useful. Uh, weigh the pros and cons of these two techniques or justify why you chose to use this function. And so showing that same code from before, I might have them look at this and now instead of just telling me, kind of, instead of analyzing the differences between these two cells and kind of the underlying assumptions, they would still do that, but they also would be able to tell me and which one is preferable and why given the data coming in. And so now, uh, you know, my code here is shrunk even further and we've got, all of the explanations are coming from the students and the student's code is kind of taking up more and more of the notebook. And then finally at the pinnacle when we're finally at create, and this is often toward it's the, the end of the kind of learning to code section of the class, um, which if the whole class is uncoding, it's the end of the class, or if this is kind of a uh, statistics class is kind of falls somewhere in the middle. And this is where we're gonna be doing things like building. So build a model to predict whether someone will default on their credit card or simulate the statistics distribution under the null or design a study to examine the relationship between age and wage or investigate whether the treatment improves survival. And so often this type of, uh, once we get to create work, I'm often in the kind of final project phase of my class where students are sort of given a prompt and at this point given an empty notebook that they're gonna completely fill with their own explanations and their own code. And so the big picture here is sort of that we're gonna build up confidence by using evidence-based pedagogical techniques we're gonna give them the good stuff first. So still in that let them eat cake, we're not doing baby steps in this. We're just kind of appropriately building up uh, knowledge as, as uh, in a way that can create confidence because if they feel like they're doing a good job along the way and having many successes along the way and many celebrations along the way, sort of as they're filling in that gappy code or able to describe what the code is doing before they're just seen a blank slate, I think that engenders good confidence and sort of, uh, and therefore good coders. And you can still use exciting examples in all of this. And so this doesn't mean you need to have boring examples or that you need students to just be memorizing things. I think in fact, this type of um, modality really lends itself to exciting examples uh, in, in opposition to just kind of boring, um, memorize what these functions are doing. Okay, so that's my spiel on how to inspire confident coders. And once we have confidence coders, the next piece, I think, at least for my students, and I think this is especially important for data science in general, and maybe just for everyone, because these days everyone's sort of having to become their own type of scientist to sort of understand what's happening in our world, uh, is to develop quantitative intuition. So now I'm gonna be talking about sort of a couple examples of how I try to help develop uh, quantitative intuition with my students. And by quantitative intuition, I actually, what I specifically mean is intuition around uncertainty. As a statistician, that's the kind of biggest focus that I have is thinking about uncertainty. And I think this is something that uh, requires a lot of focus and, and it can sometimes not be intuitive. And so building up intuition around uncertainty is really important. And so 
So I'm going to give kind of three examples of this. The first is uh, the first example I'm going to talk about is uncertainty in your data. And so the, the fact that data itself can be uncertain or there can be kind of uncertainty in the values or how the data was collected or there could be missing values. This is a concept that I find um, surprises students more than kind of as someone who's been working with data for a long time. It always surprises me how surprising that is because I forget about what it was like to first sort of have your world shattered a little bit that most of the, the information that we get is based on incomplete data. But, but what I mean by this is basically thinking about where did the data come from? What are the incentives or potential biases from the people that were collecting this data? Are the values consistent? And so uh, for that, we can use sort of the actual coding that these confident coders are able to use to sort of look at the actual values in the data set. I like to give an example where uh, they're sort of, when, especially when we're thinking about like data cleaning and data quality, um, giving a, a large data set where they're asked to sort of clean it and fit a model that has some inherent contradictions, which are extremely common in a, a lot of data sets that are floating out there. So, for example, here's a small example of one where uh, we've got an age variable and we have an age category variable and they contradict each other. So the age here is written in as 33, but the age category is written as 20 to 30. And so these type of kind of contradictions are things that I think it's it's important to sort of find data that that's realistic in the in the way that it's portrayed, because especially if they're going to be data scientists in the workforce, this is going to be stuff that they're seeing and having them think through kind of if you were faced with data like this, what would you do kind of which value do you trust more which one maybe feels like it was which one could have been more likely to be uh, like a data entry error, which one is less likely to be a data entry error, and sort of having them learn how to document their steps of data, a data cleaning process in such a way that it's fully reproducible so that someone else can see what their decision making was uh, and be able to sort of for themselves decide whether uh, they think that was appropriate. For example, some students might say that 33 is the right number because that seems pretty precise. In fact, here was 33.06706. And so that sounds like they, that person really knew what they were talking about. And maybe the categorization was wrong, saying 20 to 30. But there are other students that might say, well, maybe the, you know, the 20 to 30 was the right bubble that was filled in, and the 33 was kind of uh, was entered incorrectly for whoever was entering the data. And so it's important for students just giving them the ability to think through this uncertainty and to just internalize that uncertainty exists, I think is most of the goal when I'm trying to help them build intuition about data uncertainty. And then the other part of the goal, of course, is to think about what are the pieces of uncertainty that you want to be focused on if you're tasked with looking at a data set and determining kind of the quality of it. And then the final piece is, is the data complete? So thinking about missing data, this is a huge thing in, in statistics, thinking about does missing data exist? And if so, how should you handle that? Uh, and depending on the level of the class, we don't even always get into how missing data ought to be handled, um, other than just saying that it ought to be noted that it exists and that it can introduce real bias when uh, when it's analyzed, uh, when data is analyzed without sort of taking into account that there was some missingness. And so for this, I think it's really helpful to introduce uh, packages and tools and things to be able to help students be able to quickly look at the contents of their data and be able to figure out uh, if there is missing data and, and the prevalence of that missing data and maybe if there's some patterns across different values. A package that I personally love for this that I like to promote is the VizDAP package. Uh, and this basically very easily will just take a data set and it'll output this nice plot that basically will show you all of the observations on the Y axis and all of the variables in the data set on the X or on the X axis. And basically it plots um, by type and so it'll show if it's numeric or integer, if there's other types, it'll show you that. So you can kind of get this big picture view of your data. But the most important piece here, I think, is that it also plots the missingness. And so you can see both kind of how many observations are missing for, for certain variables. For example, here, the ozone variable is missing the most out of any in this data set. And you also can immediately look at patterns. And so if there was a pattern, something like everyone who is missing ozone was also missing solar or something like that, you can easily discern that from a plot like this. And so I think teaching this type of kind of uh, data visualization that includes visualizations about missing data is really crucial. A lot of the data visualization techniques that we teach for kind of the exploratory data analysis 
excludes the idea of missing data. In fact, often missing data is just, uh, it's, it's eliminated from those plots. And I think this is kind of, it's a, it's a missed opportunity for teaching and it's also a missed opportunity for kind of engendering good, um, kind of good processes for our data scientists because missing data is really important to, to notice and, um, and find ways to appropriately account for. Okay, so another example of how I can how I build intuition in the classroom around uncertainty is helping students think about uncertainty in their inference. And so what, what I mean by inference is a, a lot of times in statistics, we're trying to estimate the relationship between uh, variables. And to do that, we often kind of calculate statistics. Uh, we will calculate things like confidence intervals and p-values to try to quantify that difference. And all of this is based on certain theory, um, and, and most of what we teach kind of at the intro levels, are they're, it's frequentist theory that relies on statistics that are not always intuitive to students. And so we're doing this thing called hypothesis testing, where basically they, they have some null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, and they're comparing the alternative to the null. And often what they're really doing kind of in lay language is trying to say, is there a relationship between these variables? Uh, the null or the default that we're going to assume that there isn't, and we're going to try to sort of test against that. But when you're thinking about kind of how this works, it's all about distributional assumptions. And often what we're doing is we're calculating a statistic, and then we want to compare the statistic that we observe to what we would expect to observe if there really was no relationship between the two variables, which would be like the distribution of that statistic under the null hypothesis. And so given that there's no relationship between these two variables, what, what, how likely is it that we would see a statistic uh, like we saw? And this is hard to build intuition around. And the best way that I've kind of come up with to do this is to have students actually uh, do it themselves. So again, building on that confidence in programming that we've gotten to. So by this point, my students are able to sort of build simulations on their own, or if we're too early in the class in terms of coding, if there's kind of not enough time to get to the top of that pyramid before this, I might actually give them the function and have them learn how to sort of map over it multiple times. And so kind of using that gappy code type piece for this. But essentially what I'm doing here is I'm doing a, a permutation test. So I'm just showing how it, instead of sort of just telling them that this is the distribution of this statistic, in this case, we're looking at a T statistic. And instead of telling them that under the null, we expect this to have a T distribution, uh, with a certain degrees of freedom, I, I might tell them that, but now I'm gonna let them kind of see that for themselves. And so I'm gonna say, instead of sort of just assuming what the distribution under the null is, let's actually generate that distribution. And so in this permutation code, this function here, the first thing I'm doing is I'm sampling from my Y variable, which basically means that I'm just scrambling my outcome. And so I'm scrambling my outcome, uh, and then I'm doing a linear model with my uh, with my variable of interest or my explanatory variable. And so by that, I'm generating a null distribution in X because I pull out the, the T statistic for this model, or for the relationship between X and Y in this model. But I've knowingly made that relationship null because I've just mixed up my Y column to be totally random uh, so that there's no relationship between X and Y. And so I show them how to do this. I show them how they can map this. They can do this 10,000 times, for example, uh, on their data to be able to sort of generate 10,000 null statistics. And then we talk about how we can plot these, these statistics under the null and they see what that looks like. And they can do things like overlay a, a, a density from a T distribution to see kind of what that distribution has. And they can also compare the statistic that they saw to that distribution. And the thing I love about this hands-on approach is then my next part is I ask them to calculate the probability of seeing a statistic uh, as extreme or more extreme than the one that they saw, so the one that they get from their original model, given that the null hypothesis is true. And so I'm asking them to basically take those null T values and compare them to the statistics that they see in their model. And they want to look at ones that are as extreme or more extreme. So basically that are in the tail that distribution and they want to see what proportion uh, fall into that range. 
And so what I've done here is I've just given them essentially, I've given them the definition of a p value. I've asked them to calculate this thing. They calculate it for me and then explain back what that calculation means. And because they understand the code, because they did it themselves, it sort of then builds an intuition about what a p value is. Because I think this, the, the concept of a p-value is very hard and a lot of students have a hard time kind of grasping it, but once they've coded it up themselves, it becomes easier for them to sort of understand what that and have, build some intuition into what that means. And then the final piece is building uncertainty in your predictions. And so uh, by this, I mean, what data do you fit your model on? How do you evaluate that model? And so for this, I, I like to give uh, a activity where first I give them some data. And I say, use this data to create a prediction model that minimizes the prediction error using the same data. And so I have a target goal here. I think they can fit any model they want. By this point, they've learned kind of some complex techniques to fit very flexible models. And so often because the thing they're trying to, to minimize is the prediction error in that same data that they're fitting the model on, they can get that very close to zero. I mean, essentially, if they could build a model that just connects the dots between uh, their X and Y variables, if you just had one variable in each, that would get a prediction error of zero in the same data. So I task them with this assignment. And then after they've done that, I give them some new data. And I say, how does this perform on the model that you just fit? And so when they use this new data and they uh, and they use the model that they created in part one, but now instead of calculating prediction error using the data that was used to create the model, they're using this new data. They see that this model, especially if it's a connect the dots model, really doesn't perform very well on new data. And so sort of by demonstrating this in a way where they can sort of see this visually and see it kind of tangibly because they're coding it themselves, it helps them to remember that and to sort of build that intuition and what we're getting at here is this bias variance trade-off, which is like the whole point of statistics, particularly when we're thinking about prediction models. And so this kind of builds up the intuition as to why when we're doing prediction modeling, instead of just, instead of using the uh, prediction error of the training data that we use to try to determine what model to, is, is kind of preferable, we use the a test data set or something like cross-validation to try to estimate that test error. And we use that to determine what model is preferable to sort of find that sweet spot between the bias variance trade-off. So all of these examples, the kind of overarching picture is first tell them where uncertainty comes from, then show them where the uncertainty comes from, and then have them tell you back where the uncertainty comes from, and then have them show you where the uncertainty comes from. And that last part, part four, is where they're actually coding it up themselves and sort of internalizing it even better. So I find this process of sort of building up intuition by telling them something, showing them something, having them tell you it back, and then having them show you is a really good way to sort of build up uh, intuitive uh, data scientists. So this obviously maps right back to that uh, Bloom's taxonomy that I talked about, where these first two pieces are focusing on that remember or the understand part. And then this third part is focusing on the apply, analyze, and evaluate. And then finally, the when they get to the final stage where they're going to be showing you kind of from the code, then you're going to be in that create phase. All right, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to uh, briefly talk about empowering strong communicators. And so with all of this, you know, we're, we're, in, we're creating these really confident coders and we're also creating, uh, hopefully, data scientists that have intuition about uncertainty, uh, which can, which has armed them with a, a great power because a lot of what is happening in our world today is data driven. And so it's really important that if we give them that power to sort of understand uh, data in such a way that they can be creating models that are probably going to be influencing how decisions are being made in our world, I think we also need to arm them with the tools to be able to communicate that appropriately. And so as I briefly mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I think of this as sort of this quadrant of, of data communication, where uh, on the x-axis we have how true something is, and so it's either true or not true, and it's obviously along some spectrum along that way. And then on the y-axis, we have how interesting it is. And so in this top quadrant, I have uh, that, that the communication, that the thing you're communicating, you're doing it in a way that's interesting. And on the bottom quadrants, you're doing it in a way that's not interesting. And so in this uh, bottom, this bottom left quadrant that's not interesting and not true, that's not really a problem because uh, I'm less worried about that because if it if it's Obviously, it's not good for it not to be true, but if it's not interesting, it's not really capturing an audience, and therefore, um, it's not going to be as much of a concern. The 
biggest concern is going to be kind of one that falls into the top quadrant. So that's not interesting, but true. This is uh, kind of where I think sometimes we land as academic statisticians. Uh, and so being able to think about how to sort of move out of that not interesting, but stay true is uh, very important. Not interesting or not true, but interesting. This is obviously the danger zone because uh, it's kind of your students that fall into this category are communicating statistical concepts that are actually not quite correct, but they're saying it in such a compelling way that it might be getting attention and, um, and muddying the water or confusing people. And then finally, the target is this, this top quadrant here, this uh, true, this true but interesting, and that's obviously where we would prefer to be. So the goal here, and what I'm going to talk about briefly, is how to basically move between these quadrants. And so first I'm going to be talking about how to move from not true to true. And so I, to do that, I'm going to use a couple examples. Uh, the first is uh, an example from recently. Uh, it was uh, estimating COVID-19 mortality for patients on a mechanical ventilator. And so this is a paper uh, that came out in JAMA, which is a, a very popular medical journal. Uh, it came out um, early in the pandemic, and it had this line in it that said, mortality for those requiring mechanical ventilation was 88.1%. And that sounded really scary and really high, uh, but it turns out that it actually really wasn't true. It was kind of a statistical error to be, to be saying that. And so this fell certainly in the interesting category. It captured many, many headlines, uh, but it did not fall into the true category. And so moving from true to interesting, the authors actually are, are true to, not true to true, the authors actually submitted a correction. And so this is kind of in the academic world, the right way to do this. They submitted a correction and the corrected text said, as of April 4th, for patients requiring mechanical ventilation, 20% uh, of the patients overall, 38 were discharged alive, which made up 3%, uh, 282 died, which made up 24%, and 72%, 831 remained in the hospital. And so this was a true, a statistically true statement. And so compared, what the previous statement was based on just among the patients uh, in this cohort, 20, uh, 24% had died and so by so that was the only percent that had actually died but three percent three point three percent were uh discharged alive and that was what they they were sort of doing one uh they they were providing the information in such a way that wasn't um wasn't accurate to what was actually happening since there were several patients that still were remaining to be followed up with and so they got that 88 percent by taking 38 out of uh out of 282 as being the only ones that were, uh, or 282 to plus 38. So sort of using that as the denominator, but it wasn't an accurate denominator because their, their population actually was over 1100 people and there were 72%, uh, there were 800 people that they actually didn't know the outcome for. And so they were sort of giving the most extreme result, which it turns out was uh, not an accurate portrayal of the data. So anyways, this is how they moved from, from uh, not true to true. And so that sort of falls into this mathematically correct. Uh, what there's different kind of concepts of what it means to be true. And I think the first is 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 your result that you're presenting mathematically correct. And so the first thing I like to tell my students is the the kind of most important piece from the get go is you want to make sure the statistics you're you're communicating are mathematically correct. Another example is a tutorial to help folks recognize uh, bad science in the news. And so this is one that I worked on with Jeff Leak as part of my postdoc. Uh, this is a TED Ed, um, it's, a, it's a TED Ed tutorial on sort of recognizing bad science in the news. And they titled this, uh, this one weird tr trick will help you spot clickbait. Uh, and this is not quite true because um, the, our actual content had several different things that can make uh, science inaccurate, and it also had several techniques kind of along the way. And so they had this kind of inaccurate title, despite the fact that the actual contents of the um, of the tutorial were correct. And this was an example where just because of how uh, this kind of relationship worked with the TED Ed folks, we didn't get to pick the title or how it was advertised, and we attempted to push back a little bit on it, and it just uh, didn't go anywhere. And so. I think this comes to the next part of the journey to true. The, the content needs to be mathematically correct, but it also needs to be marketed correctly. So the title needs to be correct. And to the best of their ability, I try to kind of uh, empower my students to um, 
be able to push back if they feel like their work has not been appropriately represented uh, and sort of giving examples of how that can happen and how it's happened to me. Coming back to this uh, COVID-19 mortality example for patients on a mechanical ventilator, uh, I think the other piece of this to sort of mention is that this uh, this first one was was highly cited. The first version of this paper, it was in you know, 301 news outlets, picked it up, several blogs, lots and lots, thousands and thousands of tweets, uh, et cetera. And this next one that was corrected, the corrected version that had the less sensational but actually tr mathematically true version, it was really not picked up by very many people at all in comparison. And so what this uh, brings up is that it's important that the on the journey to true that not only is it mathematically correct and marketed correctly, but also it's disseminated correctly. And so sort of helping students think about how they would be disseminating information. And I think this is important because my students, you know, some of them may be the ones that are writing that JAMA paper, but some of them may be the ones that end up in journalist roles that would be reporting on it and sort of building that confidence and also the, the intuition around, you know, when you report on something that, that involves statistics, kind of making sure that you're following up on whether those statistics are correct and whether there are corrections to those and that you're kind of disseminating those corrections appropriately. And then finally, here's an example from uh, examining uh, COVID-19 cases uh, per 100,000 people in Georgia by county. And this got a lot of attention on Twitter. So there was this visualization in this dashboard where um, somebody put two maps side by side and they, they sort of were purporting that the dashboard was being misleading because it didn't give you a good view on a uh, kind of case increase because the bins were updating in both of these cases. And so it turns out if you actually went to uh, to view this chart online, uh, it said that the charts below present a number of newly con confirmed COVID cases over time. It's meant to aid whether the outbreak is growing, leveling off. But that was actually just part of the picture. Uh, and if you opened it wider, you could actually see that there was a disclaimer that these were that was referring to sort of a line chart and that these were these charts here were actually meant to be just uh, snapshots of what was happening. And in fact, I found that some of the conversation around kind of what people wanted out of these charts was a little bit unrealistic because, you know, the binning that was done was probably based on the current quantiles, which is actually an appropriate method for binning. Uh, and, it, and in something like a pandemic, there's no way to know kind of what those binnings should be in the future because you would expect them to grow, but you don't know for sure kind of when they're going to grow or how big they might grow to. And so in general, these plots really shouldn't be viewed side by side, and they weren't viewed side by side in the dashboard. But what this told me is that not only is it important that you're doing the technically correct thing, um, in this case, this is technically correct the way that the dashboard was created. And in fact, it was even disseminated correctly and marketed correctly. Um, on mobile, it was harder to see, but when you had the full screen, you could see some disclaimers about what this plot was actually meant to do. But audiences that are looking at these uh, at, at, at dashboards were constantly screenshotting them. This was a very common approach. and. Um, and and we were seeing this a lot on Twitter and they were sort of getting misused in this way. And so what that tells me is that it's actually really important how the audience interprets interprets it as well. And so the fact that a lot of people were misinterpreting these plots or maybe using them inappropriately suggests that maybe those plots shouldn't be there or need a bigger warning or need to have some kind of a different method to be able to demonstrate the information they're trying to portray uh, to make sure that the audience interprets it correctly. Okay, so now let's talk about moving from not interesting to interesting. And I think I only have about five minutes left, so I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit quickly. But uh, the big picture here is kind of an example that I give here is my dissertation, for example, was not particularly interesting to the average collaborator. I found it interesting, but uh, they didn't necessarily. And so moving it from not interesting uh, but true to uh, still true but interesting was suggestions like putting things into blog posts uh, that include lots of visualizations and kind of more common language that are sort of bite-sized and kind of give the most important pieces of information. And so I try to show my students how to do this when they've when they've done a really large report, they also have to kind of write an abstract and give me a single figure that kind of summarizes the big picture of what they're trying to say. And so the journey to interesting there's kind of the pieces are first, I think, medium. So from a long PDF to a short blog post, I think uh, the medium that you're you're presenting this on is really important. 
length, uh, only including the important stuff. I think things get less interesting the more details you get. So kind of making sure that you give the very important details, but uh, only only as much as in, is needed. Uh, complexity, only necessary equations and ditch the jargon if possible. Focus, uh, pick a single message. And so, for example, my dissertation had several messages in it, which is appropriate for a dissertation, but not appropriate for a blog post. My blog post just focused on a small piece of that, which I think is crucial for good communication. Uh, visuals, humans like pictures. I try to sort of uh, empower my students to include really compelling visuals. And then finally, marketing, kind of learning how to promote your work and uh, in a way that's going to be interesting to, to a variety of audiences, which is sort of, I try to have my students think about how could they uh, promote what they're doing if they had some stakeholders that were interested in it. So true is sort of thinking about being mathematically correct, marketed correctly, disseminated correctly, audience interprets correctly, and putting this all together. Basically, we have some of this is consider the audience. And so uh, make sure I, I try to teach my students to make sure that they're really considering who the audience is. Uh, consider the content, make sure that it's mathematically correct, make sure you're including compelling visuals. And finally, consider the marketing, make sure that you're marketing it correctly and disseminating it correctly. So that's all I have. I'm, I'm happy to spend the next couple minutes. I think I have about four minutes left to answer a couple of questions in case there are any. Um, but thank you all for listening. I hope this has been a useful, uh, a useful little tutorial. As I mentioned here, I'll go back to my original slide so you can see um, my these slides can be found at lucymcgowan.com slash talk. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lucy Stats. Uh, and thank you so much. We miss the opportunity to give you claps and applause. And that was very kind. I appreciate your <laughs> claps. <laughs> Lucy, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I see one question that was, oh, there's some claps appearing on the forum. Thank uh, you. Clap emojis. Yes, clap emojis. Wonderful. Um, uh, one question from uh, on the on the forum is about your Gappy code. And yeah. many more claps are coming in. I love that. I really love emoji claps. Um, it says regarding Gappy code, uh, Gappy notebooks don't run end to end. That is, they're not testable. What do you do about it in practice? Commenting out the Gappy sales, maybe, although if other cells depend on them, that wouldn't work. So maybe share your techniques. Yeah, that. that's a great question. So I opted, and this is going to, so when I'm doing this in, for example, like in our studio notebook, I'll uh, set the evaluation to false. And so I make it so that that section doesn't evaluate. Uh, and then the students have to flip that when they're running the code themselves so they can compile the document fully and it'll just show them that code. Um, another way to do this kind of in a Jupyter notebook, you can also include that code kind of as markdown text so they can copy that code and then paste it into a cell and fill in the gaps themselves. Um, the question of it depending, if it depends, if you have code that kind of depends on it, often when I'm doing this gappy code, I do it such that it's going to be the last part of the coding exercise. So they're going to see my code. If they're at the stage where they're still seeing some of my full code, that's going to be all on top. And then the gappy code will kind of subsequently come. Uh, if they're at the stage where they're in full gappy mode code, then gappy, gappy code mode, then they're going to have it sort of the whole code, all of it will be gappy such that they could run that document and there's nothing dependent because they would have to themselves kind of fill it in sequentially. It's a good question. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I love your, uh, the, the analysis you gave at the end. Uh, I don't see any questions. So I'm going to you know, take a, a moment to comment. Um, if somebody comes up with a question, I'll pay attention to that. Uh, the analysis you gave at the end about, uh, you know, the connection between true and interesting, it seems like something we should all be taught, you know, as part of critical thinking, in, uh, especially in these times um, when the, in a part, we don't even have a, a proper, you know, uh, statistics education, in my opinion, which should be, um, across the board taught to everyone. So that's a really fantastic analysis. Uh, is it part of the um, of the MOOCs that you teach? Uh, do you do you make that yeah. to disseminate that? I haven't uh, actually put that in an online class. I use that in my 
current classes, um, I have uh, especially my statistical learning class, which is sort of a more applied class that typically attracts people that are going to be interested in data science. I have a whole section that sort of is focused on um, thinking about kind of communication and, and, and actually it also thinks about data ethics and things like that as well. We have like a whole little segment on it. And so I do it there, but I don't have it yet online. I, I, I would at some point yes. hopefully I'd like to build something because I do think I agree with yeah. you. The purpose is it's more than just for people who are going to be statisticians. Like I also want this for my students that are going to be journalists or politicians or kind of whatever they're going Absolutely. to be doing to think about these. Absolutely. I can see that being like a, one of those short MOOCs that is just based on that with examples that you could pull from, um, uh, you know, things that have hit the news. I have a very short module that I include on statistics for my engineers competition class. And I have an example about, um, uh, lead in lipstick and how uh, there was, you know, some, some lots of um, um, press about the possibility of uh, being poisoned by lead in lipstick. And uh, it turns out it's, you know, you can do the analysis and uh, it was just fear mongering. So I'm sure you can find, uh, oh, yeah. you know, half a dozen examples and you could fill a very lo a lovely uh, online module on just this. Uh, I, I would love to watch it and I, um, and be part of that. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. That's one a wonderful topic. And, uh, uh, there's some more claps and thank yous on the forum, but I don't see a question and, uh, we've come to the end of the hour. So I want to thank you very much. Rishima is, uh, now also joined as a co-panelist. Do you, do you want Rishima to, to, to comment or ask a question? I do. I just wanted to comment and say that, you know, your presentation was terrific. Um, I come from a statistics background as well. And the two items that resonated with me were the Gappy code and let them eat cake. And um, I love this idea that it is more accessible and learnable to people and that it doesn't require so much suffering to learn how to code. Yes, I, I like that too. Yeah, there's no need for suffering in this world. There's enough of it yes. already. We don't need to inflict it. <laughs> right. Uh, Thank you. And as a final comment, and you know, even though you, you, you know, you structure things around in the beginning of your talk around Bloom's taxonomy, I did notice though, when you read about the, like the critiques of Bloom's taxonomies often have to do with the fact that remembering uh, is placed at the bottom of the pyramid and sometimes interpreted as not important. And on the other hand, create is put at the top of the pyramid, which is sometimes interpreted as it ca can only happen at the end of a long learning journey. But what you showed, in fact, did reflect that there is an iterative uh, process and an integration of all of these levels in every step of the learning process. And I really did like that approach because it, it, it incorporated a, 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 an antidote for what is sometimes seen as the main critiques of Bloom's taxonomy. Yes, thank you. That was actually, that's the one difference, or the, there were a couple of differences between some of the things I had read kind of with other people's writing on this in particular with a focus on, on programming and coding. But one of the main differences, I think, between sort of my approach and what I had seen other folks do was exactly that sort of being able to integrate, like doing it in such a way that you're still doing it appropriately. So you're sort of having more time spent on different pieces, but you can still kind of work through the whole process. A single assignment could contain learning objectives. Yeah, and multiple. Absolutely. If you want to let them eat cake, they have to be able to create from the beginning. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's wonderful, Lucy. I want to thank you very, very much for participating uh, at JupyterCon. And uh, this was uh, a, the, the only keynote that had R at, uh, the cent in the center stage, and we want to be inclusive of all the languages. So I'm really, really glad you accepted our invitation. Well, thank and, you. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, we'll soon share the, the video in the YouTube uh, channel. Thanks, Lucy. Good to thank meet you. Thank you so much.